How's everybody doing? I'm Will Rosenzweig. This is what I look like. Um, I'm really happy to see you here in person. And thanks for dealing with all the protocols and uh, being so enthusiastic, cooperative, and um, present. So it's, I was realizing that it's been a hundred weeks since I was in this auditorium. Two years ago, we had the Secretary of Agriculture for the state of California, Karen Ross, here as our guest. One of the things that is noteworthy about Edible Ed is that we get some of the foremost thought leaders and change makers in food to come to campus. So we are going to reinstate that beginning tonight with our very special guest, Larissa Zimberoff, who's a celebrated author and journalist and has released a new book called Technically Food that we're going to tell you about a little later tonight. I was thinking about, well, a couple things. You probably were all outside today enjoying this spectacular spring-like weather. And um, just as a, as a practice, I love to show some of the pictures uh, in my garden. And just this week, the plum and nectarine trees burst into bloom. So I, I show this to you now because in a couple of months, I'll be bringing uh, plums and nectarines to class. Like today, I'm bringing you the oranges, which you probably saw on a slide a couple of weeks ago. And um, I was just going to share one other thing. Yesterday, I had just one of the most fun office hours. I wanted to encourage any of you that want to talk to me offline about your interests or journey or how Edible Ed fits into your life and future. But yesterday, one of my former students named Charlene, who got her bachelor's degree here a year or two ago, she was actually the founder. She was so inspired by this class during her junior year that during her senior year, she started the Food at Berkeley group. Is anybody a member of that, FAB? Yeah, so Charlene now works for DocuSign. And she was like, you know, Professor Will, I, I'm really glad I have this job, but you know, my real passion is food. And so what I'm doing is I'm working for DocuSign during the day, and then on the weekend, I'm working at this cafe, and I'm baking cookies and making sandwiches and serving people. And it was just so exciting to feel that she was so clear about her long-term path and her connection to food and that she wanted to become a food systems change maker. She certainly was one on campus, but that she was continuing to kind of incorporate and integrate these personal interests along with her professional path. And, you know, as she put it, the need to pay the bills and get some really good experience and, and all. So it, it was just, it was very heartening to me to, to stay in touch with her. And I just wanted to invite, let you know that I am uh, available to you, uh, probably most effectively on Zoom still right now, um, also because the office space around the campus is a little limited too. So if you want to do that, you know, my contact and my Calendly link are in the syllabus. Okay, there's a couple new people in the class. Let's see, how, how can I make this work? I might need manual puja help. Maybe it's turned off? No, it's turned on. So tonight, how might we develop a clear perspective about new foods of the future? That's gonna be our topic. And um, I thought just I'd take two minutes to, or five minutes to talk about what we're up to in this class. There's a number of new people. Um, I should ask the tech people, if I wander around, is that a problem or is this just a wide shot? It's okay, we're good. Um, so what are we up to? So Edible Ed is a class that was conceived by Alice Waters, who you met the first week of class. And her idea was that we could learn everything about the world and ourselves through food. 
and that we should have a class um, that builds on the curriculum that she and her colleagues developed for the K through 12 people. And so um, she and Michael Pollan and a number of other people took up that um, challenge. And I was fortunate to inherit the class about six years ago. Um, and maybe later in the semester, I'll tell you a little bit about how I got to be the inheritor of that <laughs> class. But the, the class is really about how do we make change in the food system. And in order to become a food systems change maker, it's really important to learn about the food system, of course. And it's also very important to understand that values really inform and guide change. So we started the semester with Alice sharing her view of food values, like she likes to call them slow food values. They were informed very much by her college visit to France and her immersion in the local markets with local agriculture and relationships to farmers and a deep sense of community around eating. And she told you those stories and she articulated her values deliciousness, beauty, local, seasonal, organic, things like that. And then a couple weeks ago, we gave you an assignment. We gave you this wonderful sheet of values. Did you, did you do that assignment where you got a chance to kind of identify your personal and core values? And then we're helping you learn how to assess or reflect how those values are manifest in your own personal choices. Really what the class is about is helping you develop an understanding of your personal place in the world, in the food world, and then connect it to a systems perspective. So we're kind of moving from me to we. That's really the, the arc of the class is to go from me to we. And You'll remember that Michael Pollan on the second class talked about the food value chain or the supply chain, and we talked about food systems and really the concept of interdependence and how everything uh, is connected and fits together. So we're also um, along the way, I like to think of this as we're developing food systems intelligence. and. The, the godmother of systems thinking is a woman named Danella Meadows. Hopefully you read the piece that I asked you to called Dancing with Systems. Um, Danella Meadows was a systems theorist, a, a, pr a prolific writer, really creative being, and all of her work is actually archived uh, in, on the internet called the Danella Meadows Project. So if you're interested more in systems thinking, she is really the guru and the guide that I like to follow. And she, she came from really kind of a technical, almost computer science background. It was, it was in the era like 50 years ago when computer simulation and modeling started to become possible. And so there was this group of people thinking that, gee, if we could model and simulate all of these complex interactions, we could predict the future. And it turned out that they couldn't predict the future <laughs> because they realized that complex systems were incredibly dynamic and somewhat unpredictable. So some of her uh, favorite guiding wisdoms to me were the future can't be predicted, but it can be envisioned and brought lovingly into being. So that's kind of a guiding principle for me as an entrepreneur in food and something that um, I hope that you will you know, think about and question, is that appropriate? And then later in the semester when we bring entrepreneurs to you, we're gonna later in the semester, probably a lot of March and April, you're gonna meet face to face with the founders and CEOs of a lot of the dynamic companies, some of which you'll hear about tonight. And one of the questions I ask you to maybe lodge in your um, thinking is, is this person uh, 
bringing this new innovation or disruption lovingly into being. Because food is really different than everything else. And I think one of the things we want to question in this class is whether the market and the invisible hand of the market um, is the appropriate force at all times to shape the decisions of how food and the food system evolves. Um, so Danella, uh, this is really hard to see, but Danella, you know, articulated these 14 principles of the systems dance. And what I like about it is it, it's playful. It's not too heavy. Systems thinking is really complicated and can be incredibly intimidating because trying to grasp all of the diverse and um, disparate connections and um, interactions and in things that are invisible. But hopefully, by engaging with it like it's a dance, you'll come to see more and more of it, and it'll be more revealed to you. And um, you'll start to see, I'm hoping by the end of the semester, that you will actually feel like you have some food systems intelligence that you didn't have at the beginning of the semester. So I highlighted a couple of these that really stand out to me, and maybe we'll use them as guides tonight for Larissa's um, presentation. But this idea of getting the beat, like what's happening? What's happening throughout the system of supply? What's, what's motivating people? What, is, what are the sort of unseen forces that are shaping the system? What is the intention of the people um, influencing the system? And then expose your mental models to the open air. So this is using the techniques that we've been practicing with reflection and tracking. These are key skill sets of um, change makers and entrepreneurs to be able to track what's happening. Uh, long time indigenous practice. Uh, and then reflecting on that to get a sense of um, what are the inherent perspectives or biases that I bring when I, when I am assessing a situation. Number four, I should have highlighted stay humble, stay a learner. I love that. That's just always bringing that curiosity and being aware of our inherent judgment. I'll skip down there to 11, expand thought horizons. So one of the things we're going to talk about tonight is this intensely interesting and heavily financed and publicized area of new foods and technically derived foods. And I'm going to ask you to think about a question which I'll plant with you now, which is which food companies that you're familiar with or that you do business with right now, that you buy their products, will be here in 2050, in almost 30 years. Keep that in mind as you hear Larissa today. And then 13, celebrate complexity rather than be intimidated by it. So, the systems dance is really intended to remind you to just stay light and grounded, flexible, with the enormous amount of um, information and complexity at hand. We've also talked a little bit about mindsets and mental models. Uh, as the semester progresses, we'll talk more about the kinds of mindsets that change makers inhabit. You probably got a sense that um, Alice, Alice's mindset, sometimes I call it pathologically optimistic. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs are. They, they see what's good and what's possible. They, they live in a state um, that, where they can will the future into being. Uh, you'll remember last week, Anna LaPay called herself a possibilist. Um, uh, Frances Moore LaPay, her mindset was really one of finding the question, right? Her curiosity really guided her. 
until she found this question that she's been working with for 50 years now. So these are mental models and mindsets, and I believe that they are almost wholly under our power and control to shape. And so one of the hopes this semester is that the people you get to meet and hear from will help you begin to identify what mental model they're working with or what mindset they're working with and help inspire you to cultivate a mindset of a change maker. So we're gonna quickly take attendance now. If you have a electronic device, you can go to this sli.do place, enter this code. We also are live streaming this for your colleagues who couldn't come to campus tonight for one reason, for medical reasons. And uh, you at home can play along too and get credit for being here if you can put your student ID in, please. Can you just raise your hand when you're done so I can know when to move on? Yeah, just, I'll give you another second or two. Let me know how quickly. Okay, 30 seconds more. I'm gonna give you that, I'll introduce you. All right, well it gives me great pleasure to introduce Larissa Zimbaroff tonight. Larissa is the author of Technically Food Inside Silicon Valley's Mission to Change What We Eat. And Larissa is a successful and accomplished journalist. And um, this book has been recommended to me by many people. I really enjoyed reading it. And when you read the introduction, you'll see that Larissa uh, was greatly influenced and inspired by Michael Pollan's book, Omnivore's Dilemma, which kind of piqued her interest to dive deeper into food. And she has been a really kind of trailblazing scout to get a firsthand look at like, what's up with these companies that are working with microbes and fungi and peas and cells and all kinds of things and what's really going on here. So I thought it would be really important you know, early in the semester to kind of leap ahead now that we've got a little bit of values, systems, and kind of a global perspective that uh, Tiffany and Anna brought last week to kind of jump ahead, like what's going on in our own backyard here that you're reading about every day, including this morning in the New York Times. Um, I have to say, when I started teaching this class, there was barely ever an article about food in the mainstream press. And it certainly wasn't on the front page, but now it is. And so I think this is so timely and so valuable for us. So let's have a warm welcome for Larissa Zimbaroff. Hi guys. I'll do what Will did and this is what I look like. It's great to see you. and It's great to be here in person. Um, so exciting. Um, so, I'm Larissa Zimbaroff. I am a journalist and now an author. Um, let's skip the photo because you don't need to see that anymore. And let's start with something a little more interactive. So uh, let's do this word cloud. What is your priority when you're deciding on what to eat? I don't want to tell you, I don't want to put any words in your minds, but um, you know, what are you thinking about? There's different things you're thinking about. So maybe pick a, maybe it's breakfast or maybe it's on the go lunch. What do you, what is the driving force for you? I had a feeling taste might be the number one. It's usually taste, price, and convenience. And it's one of the reasons a lot of the companies that are in food tech like to talk about price parity, about getting down in price, about somehow achieving this magical cheap food um, that will get everyone to buy it. 
Um, we're going to come to that later. Let's see where, if we've got any good ones. Nutrition, thank you. Whoever wrote that? Okay, someone said something bad. I'm going to ignore that. Um, we got yummy, easy, texture. Texture is a great one, especially with all these uh, new foods because texture is often where they miss it. Awesome. All right, I think we'll stop. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, especially the person that did the P word. Um, okay, so how is technology reshaping our food industry? It is one of the driving questions that's made me write this book, that drove me to write this book. But I'll tell you a little bit about myself first because I came to a food career late in my life. I was in the technology uh, industry and I was in San Francisco. I was working for, I worked in dot coms, uh, internet 1.0, internet 2.0. Didn't ever think I'd get out of it. Uh, eventually, I got laid off twice in a row and I moved to New York and I went to grad school for creative writing. Then, because I love food and because I was so passionate about food, I started writing about food. It took me some time before I started focusing on how technology was uh, reshaping what we eat. Um, I sort of straddled writing about chefs or ingredients and then also technology, but because I had that background in working in San Francisco in the Bay Area, working for tech companies, it really made sense. Um, the other thing that drives my, my passion for food and for that one or two people who wrote nutrition up there, I have type 1 diabetes. And because I have type 1 diabetes, I think about food much, more, much differently than everyone else. There's only about a million of us in the US who have type 1 diabetes. I look at food for their macronutrients, their protein, their carbohydrates, their fiber, their fat. And these are the things that I have to think about every day, every meal before I eat. I have to figure out how much insulin my body needs. I have to be the computer. So I say that I see food, see through food. Um, I have like x-ray vision. And that, that, that concept is what I felt like I could bring to the food tech world and explain it to people and figure out like, was any of this good for me? Because the companies are all mission-based. They want to save the planet. They want to end harm to animals, which are like great things. Like I don't not want those things, but I also want to be healthy. And I know that eating junk food or processed food or highly processed food, you know, we're starting to hear those words more, more and more frequently, ultra processed. So I wrote my book because I wanted to know what went into it, how they were, how they were making it. I wanted answers to all of my questions. And if you read my reviews on Amazon, you'll see most of them are good. Most of them are very good. There's a few that are from my relatives because they'll have the same last name as me. Um, but there's one where the guy says, she had more access than anybody else, and I did, um, and, she, and her questions weren't answered. Because he's right, I couldn't answer all of my questions because the founders don't want to tell me everything. And this is one of the problems with where our food is going. The transparency, which is an important word to Will and to this class, is missing. Um, I wrote my book because I wanted to find transparency. But unfortunately, it's being clouded over by things like IP, by Silicon Valley, um, by venture capitalists, by Wall Street. Um, so there are secrets um, in our food and you know, there was this brief window where we thought Michael Pollan and Dan Barber and Alice Waters were, you know, bringing us farm to table and slow food, and we were going to know more. Um, the organic industry was, was really, like, growing, but now we've got technology. And these companies aren't really food companies. They're not looking to make you healthy. They're looking to answer technology problems. Um, so, anyways, um, so that's about me, a little bit about the book, um, this role of technology about figuring out how mycelium is grown in a tank, right? So maybe some of you know, how many here have eaten corn? Q-U-O-R-N? Couple, <laughs> not many. Um, it's been around since the 70s, since the 80s, and it's made from mycelium, a fungus underground, right? They found this fungus, they decided it could grow and become a great protein. Um, they are actually, despite this class not having it a lot, it's quite popular. 
but it, the supply chain is not great, and they haven't really figured that part out of it. But now there are tech companies that are growing mycelium in big silver tanks, kind of like a brewer's tank, and they're making meat out of it, quote unquote meat. They're making like chicken or a steak, and the mycelium, which is the root-like structure underground, and its mushrooms are the fruiting bodies. Mycelium is um, a wonderful protein source, and it doesn't need a lot of processing. So in my book, it is one of the ones I'm more excited about. And there's actually a company from Berkeley called Prime Roots, and the two founders went to UC Berkeley and are now making bacon, and they're making meat out of this. this they're making it out of, oh my gosh, <laughs> what's that? Someone's phone. <laughs> I thought it sounded like a hurricane warning. <laughs> Uh, so they're making it out of koji, which is also a fungus, which is in the family of um, similar to mycelium. The FDA actually doesn't um, distinguish between mushrooms. Mushrooms aren't plants. They're fungi. They're fungus. But um, it, it, I don't know if that'll change. But this, this notion that um, we had this idea of like pulling things from the ground and then taking them into the lab to see what grows fast what has a good protein content, what um, might have good texture, and then growing it again and again and again um, is like kind of almost unfathomable, but it's what's happening. Um, if I'm talking too fast, let me know. Okay, let's do another, let's do a poll. So what food tech are you most excited about? Um, Precision fermentation, and, how, and are the people here who don't know what precision fermentation is? Great, okay. Novel new plant proteins, cultured animal meat, CRISPR, is there anybody that doesn't know what CRISPR is? Okay, CRISPR is a, it's a way of editing uh, the genes of a plant, and taking out bad genes in a single plant, or cutting out or turning on or off genes in a plant's DNA. Um, unlike GMO, which some countries look, a, look askance at, CRISPR is seen as something that isn't changing fundamentally the plant. It is just editing out what might be bad. Um, I'm working on a story right now about lab-made chocolate, and the, one of the plant geneticists is using CRISPR to improve the yield of cacao plants or to improve its resistance from pathogens. But CRISPR isn't approved everywhere because it's still considered a novel uh, technology. Um, and the last one is advances in using microbes. So which one excites you the most? Uh, one, one quick note. Oh, <laughs> sorry. And mycelium, which I just, just described to you, is actually whole mass fermentation, not precision fermentation. Uh, okay, I like it. Novel new plant proteins is a winner at 35%. Um, the next one is CRISPR. Then... We've got advances in using microbes. Culture, yes, cultured animal meat and then precision fermentation. So precision fermentation, and we're gonna talk a little bit more in a little, little later, but um, so, so I just mentioned that mycelium is whole mass fermentation. So basically they're taking spores that they initially found maybe in the woods um, and they're growing it in tanks by feeding it nutrients. Some, some interesting companies are using um, scrap, like potato peels from another company. So they're using upcycled ingredients to help feed the spores to help them grow into fibers. So that's whole mass fermentation because when you're done, you just have this big mass of material that you can squeeze the water out of and you've just got this like stuff. It kind of looks like tuna fish maybe. Um, but precision fermentation is what a number of companies are doing, many in the Bay Area. Um, Perfect Day is one example. They're in Berkeley. They're working on proteins that are in cow's milk. So two, the two main proteins are 
casein, and whey. These are the proteins that help us get stretchiness, that help us get cheese that melts, that help us get a mouthfeel. Um, these are things that help ice cream taste more delicious, um, that help pizza, mozzarella on pizza stretch. So um, whey is already, you can already find it in ice cream. You can find it in some cream cheese. The cream cheese is actually available, Perfect Days cream cheese is available at Boy Chick Bagels, if you want to get it. Um, I'm not here like promoting their cream cheese or this company, but just so you know. <laughs> the bagels are maybe better than the cream cheese. Uh, actually, the cream cheese is very good. But so precision fermentation is how they're taking these singular proteins that are functional proteins that we can use in other foods. And so the, the complication here is that it's not vegan and it's not dairy free. So the benefit in the founder's eye is that they're vegan, they don't want to harm animals, but they want cheese that stretches and they want great mouthfeel. So for them, it's okay, right? They are using a, a bioidentical protein that is in cow's milk, but they're not eating something from a cow, okay? The, the arguments of whether that's vegan or whether that's plant-based is very complicated and no one's figured that out yet. So um, it's actually an area that I think a group of students would have fun sort of tackling. Like what should we be calling these things? What should they be considered? You know, a friend of mine bought the Brave Robot ice cream that has non-animal whey protein in it and she texted me mad because she's like, this is dairy, right? It is still dairy. It just didn't have lactose, because they, they had made it without lactose. So that's precision fermentation. And there are companies making proteins from eggs. There are companies making um, you know, um, cells from, from cacao. They're going to just make like the um, uh, polyphenols that are, might be in, found in something that might be beneficial to our bodies. Um, if, if we want to bring this back to Will, Will's garden, um, the soil that this, these oranges came from, what, what we're missing from technology is the relationship between the soil and the plant, between the roots and the fruit. Um, there are people looking into the microbiome of soil um, and our microbiome, right? This is like such a newer area that we still don't know much about, but there are questions of how important is that relationship of a plant growing in soil and being stressed by sun or not enough water or um, you know, and different elements, right? Um, bugs eating it. Those are all things that actually can make a better tasting fruit or a better tasting uh, leafy green or vegetable. Um, as we move into vertical farms where we're growing f f uh, leafy greens in potting medium, no soil, we're, we're losing that. Um, and is that something that our bodies are going to be missing? Uh, these are questions that I looked into for my book, and I have people you know, kind of giving me conversations about it, but we haven't figured it out. Um, you guys all probably know that nutrition science is so complicated. Um, every day it's like we're told something different. We're told that like, you know, something's good for us, something's not good for us. We're all different. You know, I have type 1 diabetes. My body behaves so much more differently than anybody else's. Um, Will is going to be different from, from uh, Jackie. So the thought that um, technology can step in and make everything one way and then just repeat it, right? Like an iPhone, right? If, if our food becomes just an iPhone that we're, re that we're replicating um, in a manufacturing plant, you know, in the middle of the country because that's what's near sugar. Um, because these, these new foods are going to need crops just like everything else. They're going to need nutrients to grow them. So um, this was something that Will sort of threw my way, which I really wanted to spend a little moment on, which is one of the trends that I'm seeing, that Will's seeing, that you, you are probably seeing, is that you know, and it's this precision fermentation idea, which is that we're uncoupling foods from their origins. Um, right now, I'm writing an article for The Atlantic about lab-made chocolate. 
this is chocolate not from cacao. Um, there is one company that's making, that's plant cell culturing cacao in the lab. So they're taking cacao cells, uh, feeding it nutrients to grow it, and then eventually they will ferment it, roast it, and mill it um, to make chocolate. But there are three other companies that are making chocolate, but not from, not from cocoa. They're making it, one's making it from barley, from the spent grains from beer making. One's making it from um, oat milk's leftover spelt from making oat milk. And one's using um, grape seeds from winemaking. That one always blows my mind. Um, they're actually in Oakland. It's called Voyage Foods. They're also making peanut butter without the peanuts. Um, and, you know, I like using them as my example because peanut butter is like a problem that exists. We, we can't bring peanut, peanuts or peanut butter into schools. Kids can't have it. We don't get peanuts on the planes anymore. You, you guys might not remember that. I used to love getting peanuts on the plane. Um, so they made a peanut spread. It's actually like really good. Um, and kids could now bring a peanut butter sandwich to school if they want. Um, their chocolate is made from grape seeds. So it's this like huge like upcycling uh, opportunity from like big wineries that have you know, tons of grape seeds. And um, they're still gonna do traditional methods of like roasting and fermenting that are, that are just like cacao. Um, but again, we're, we're uncoupling from, from nature. We're uncoupling from origins. Um, is that okay? You know, I don't wanna stand up here and say, no, we can't do that, because this is happening. For these companies that are working on chocolate, there are many things that are wrong with the chocolate industry, and the chocolate industry has not changed in decades. Farmers are paid like a couple hundred dollars a year. That's it. And because of that, Children are forced to work on farms. A lot of attention is paid to that. Um, farmers think about th things like yield and maybe there's clear cutting so that they can plant more trees to get more cacao, but they're never paid more. And the chocolate industry, Hershey's, Nestle's, Mars, the big guys, never change. They pay them very little, they pay the same per ton, and then eventually the price of the chocolate bar goes up. So we foot the bill for the bad things that the cocoa industry are doing. Other things that they point to, the, these, these um, startups that point to um, an increase in pathogens. In their mind, the cocoa industry or cacao plants um, are on the verge of, you know, decline. They'll, they'll end because climate change, because of lack of rainfall or high temperatures, which will drastically affect cacao plants. So while peanut butter had a problem right now, a problem we are seeing in front of our eyes, um, a problem that exists in schools and on planes or you know, wherever peanut allergies exist, the chocolate problem doesn't exist. So how do we feel about this idea of technology companies look around, because food is so exciting, and they look around to see, well, what, what is it, where is there not an analog? Where is there not a vegan version? And let me make that, let me go after that market because there's like, they call it white space. When animal cell culture existed, fish didn't. And so then we got startups that are now making fish. Um, when animal cell culture existed, no one was making dairy and we had Perfect Day and another company called Clara that's now called the Every Company working on these like precision fermented, fermentation proteins. Um, so this chocolate is funny because I keep thinking, well, chocolate's not necessary to live, which may or may not be true to everybody. Um, I love dark chocolate. The chocolate that they're making is more of a milk chocolate, a chocolate that is really dependent upon sugar, sugar and mouthfeel and creaminess. So it doesn't really need the taste. Um, when I think about what they say, what these startups tell me in, in getting, trying to get me, win me over, right, with their, their plans, um, and they say, well, we want to replace the chocolate in M&Ms. Well, then I think, okay, yeah. Well, that'd be great. Let's, let's replace the chocolate in M&Ms. And then someone else might say, well, what about the farmer? The farmer's going to lose his job. So I, what's interesting about these tech companies is that they exist in these vertical silos. Um, what they're not doing is systems thinking, like Will's pointed out, which is that you've got to talk to everybody to understand where else you are, what else you are affecting, and what else we might be missing. 
Um, it's these questions that I'm, I'm trying to bring to the field. So other, other areas that people are working on, there's whiskey without barley. So they're just um, figuring out how to pull the flavors um, using chemical flavors, and then they're just adding ethanol. Um, you know, in their mind, they're like saving the crop and the water. You know, so everyone thinks that they're, that they're not using a crop, but they're still, they're still dependent on agriculture. We are all dependent on agriculture. And so uh, by ignoring it, we're like just neglecting it. And we shouldn't because they're both gonna be necessary to our future. Um, so the whey minus the cow, it used to just be perfect day working on this, but now it's a multitude. Um, and how many of you guys have tried just eggs? A few more. Okay, wait, how many of you here are plant-based? Okay, it looks like this side. <laughs> well, they're scrambled eggs made from mung beans. It's actually really, really good. It's one of the things I tend to buy more often than not. Um, but there are other scrambled eggs that are made from like algae powder. There's some that are made from pea powder. Some are more successful than others. I think I have another poll for you guys. Okay. I've only talked about culture meat a little, but we'll get into it more, but I wanted to get your take on it first. Okay, so it's a slide, it's a slido. Thoughts on cultured animal meat. I don't eat animal meat. Fake meat, no way. I can't wait to try it. I'd rather eat a plant-based burger. I'm excited, but I want to know more. Pooja's gonna help me out. Thank you, Pooja. Ooh. Got a lot of enthusiasm. All right, well, the, the strong winner here is I'm excited, but I want to know more. That is exactly how I felt, too. Uh, the next one was I'd rather eat a plant based burger. <laughs> okay, so cultured meat. Um, how many of you guys know Upside Foods? Okay. How many of you guys like food? Okay, thank you. Okay, I just want to make sure all your hands worked. Okay. So, <laughs> Upside Foods is in Emeryville. They are, they have one of the strongest funding to date of cultured meat. They just built a pilot facility, and this pilot facility was built, cost, probably cost about $50 million and it's to get the FDA and the USDA to approve cultured meat for sale. They have Dominique Crenn, the chef in San Francisco, ready to sell the chicken in her fancy three Michelin star restaurant. I've been in to have the, the chicken. It is, um, and it's the, there's an article in the New York Times today, but the chicken, it's also in my book, but um, the chicken had great, great texture. Like, you know, it had like that grip and that like tug. Um, it had like this fibrous taste. The, the flavor was really like not there for me. Um, but it's a question I bring up a lot, which is what's more important for meat? Do we want texture or do we want flavor? Most people tell me I need both. They're, and they're mostly right, but I think there are a lot of foods we eat that don't have great flavor. Texture to me is more important because if the texture doesn't work, I'm not going to get there. And flavor, I could just add mustard or ketchup or whatever. Um, so Upside Foods is in the Emeryville Shopping Center where there's like a guitar center and a, maybe an anthropology or something or Urban Outfitters, right near the train station. You can go. You can look in the window. They actually want you to, eventually they want to bring people in and maybe that's something I can help Will get organized and take a tour. Um, you know, I both, I'm excited by what they're doing. I also think we're being told not to eat as, many, as much red meat, so why would I eat this meat? Um, I can just eat plants. I can just eat new plants, more biodiversity. New, new, when I put new plant proteins on that list, I meant like, you know, gross stuff I haven't had yet. Like, there's actually a company in San Diego that's, um, growing lemna or duckweed, they're growing it in big race ponds and then they're extracting the protein from it and they're gonna sell this protein to companies to make burgers out of. I wanna see more burgers from 
plant proteins I don't know yet. Um, you know, I don't need more peas. <laughs> I don't need more soy. I don't need more wheat. Um, even though those are the things that our, our system is set up to produce. Our system is set up to produce just a few things. It's really hard. Um, it's, it's, we're burning out our system on like five things. And so what I, the opportunity here is that we can bring new minds and new voices to the food system that are much younger than me and younger than the people that are in the startups now that are gonna think of things we don't know yet. Um, mung beans were used in Asia, so I didn't realize it was something that could be used until someone sort of tapped it. Um, well, Southeast Asia, I know in India, it's been used for a long time. Um, and now it's here in the US and now the eggs are going back, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. Um, but this idea of, <sighs> Um, right now, what we have in the food system, in the food tech world, is um, replications of what we know. Um, analog is a word I use a lot, so we've got the, the original and then the analog, but it could also be the reverse. You know, the analog could be the original and the, and the, the new one could be, could be the, 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 the reality, right? We might, maybe like tuna, like what if bluefin tuna are like completely overfished and they disappear from the ocean. We may one day only have the analog of tuna, but what we're missing in food tech 1.0 is going beyond what's possible. So what hasn't been thought of yet? What hasn't been created yet? Um, why are we only having burgers? Like, I don't need another burger. I don't need another chicken nugget. I don't need a hot dog. You know, make me something I don't know. You know, I love tofu and tempeh, there's a company out here out that makes uh, pumfu. It's made from pumpkin seeds. It's like tofu. Like, make me something I don't know yet, and make me a shape and a kind that that doesn't exist, but that's good for me, and that doesn't take a lot of processing. Which takes me back to mycelium, which is why I am still very much a fan of mycelium because it doesn't need a lot of what I call post-processing work done to it after it's grown. Um, it. It doesn't need to be ultra processed to be good, and it's the components are healthy for me. And I always bring it back to me. Um, can I eat this? Um, is my blood sugar gonna go nuts on this, this crappy food? If crappy food will make my blood sugar go nuts. And if we have the pandemic, you know, as any example, we all have these underlying conditions and we did not fare well. Something I haven't really talked about yet is the American diet. A big reason I wrote this book is that the American diet has really set us up for failure, and we're just shipping out these foods to other countries, right? Now that we're not drinking soda, other countries are drinking our soda. Um, these companies want a profit, so they're, they're not gonna stop, like once we stop drinking it, once we kind of wise up, they're just gonna sell it to other people. And <clears throat> this food tech community is, depending on big food to help them scale up. They're depending on big food to help them um, organize their supply chain. They're depending on, they're, they're following big food's footsteps. Um, this cultured animal meat, it, it's exciting, but it's eventually just gonna be made in a factory, right? What if all of our food is just made in factories? Now I know part of that is just like, well, I know the old system. It's sort of like I wax on about the library, right? Um, going to a library, you know, checking a book out from the library, and one day that might not really exist anymore. Um, so part of it is that, like, oh, when I went to the movies, it was a quarter, you know, kind of like, you know, every generation is gonna, gonna think something different. Um, but this is what I offer you, which is that you, you can think about food in a better way, one that doesn't, perpetuate the American diet, one that doesn't think that burgers are the only shape, one that um, pushes the envelope of what is possible, what ingredients we could have um, on our plate. Um, I'm doing a talk soon in New York that's going to um, discuss regenerative farming and future food. And my hope is that we can like spend time, wh whose ever phone that is, <laughs> Uh, 
my hope is that, is that eventually we get to a place where we're not in food tech silos, that technology is the only way to solve problems, but that we work hand in hand with nature, with farmers, with this like, it's, it, in my mind, it's a hybrid solution that we're gonna eventually get to where um, our food comes from multiple places. Um, that's, that's, that's what I think is like, makes the most sense. Um, this transition period is going to be strange. Um, the non-dairy milk aisle is sort of an example of an explosion in like products. And soon we're gonna have that sort of everywhere in the market. Um, meat, fake meat, chicken, fake chicken. Um, all these products do better when they're side by side with their real counterpart. Um, you know, I think maybe like little kids of today who are like under five, they may not know that cow, that milk came from a cow. Um, so there's this like really interesting tension that's gonna happen in the next 10 plus years where decisions are going to be made about how we eat and there's an opportunity to influence it and you guys, you guys have that opportunity. Um, I think I have maybe one more. Oh, wrong way. Oh, okay, so a big influence on this food tech community is the investor dilemma. One of the things, <laughs> one of the things that um, I, I wanted to make sure people understood is that in, by writing the book is that um, investors are fueling this like fervor for new foods. They all, not all, many are um, passionate about doing good for the world or making the world a better place for their children. Um, one of the issues here is that few are saying, I want to make this world better for everybody. Um, few are saying, I want to make this healthier for you. Um, I think what's interesting is that the, the founder and CEO of Upside Foods was a cardiologist. And so a cardiologist's one job is to like tell older people that they're not being healthy and they need to change their, <laughs> their ways to, to, to get better if they have a heart attack. But now he's going to make animal meat <laughs> so that we have animal meat to eat to replace animals that he doesn't want to see killed. So the priority there is the animal. Um, but the investors are, are driving this, this, um, this uh, change in our food system, which may or may not be for better. We don't know. Um, one of the investors I talked to for the book talked about investment as a pre-Beyond Meat and a post-Beyond Meat. Pre-Beyond Meat, when Beyond Meat went public, people didn't invest in cultured meat. People didn't invest in everything wildly. And after Beyond Meat, when I when IPO, and it was like the second biggest in the, that year, or maybe that decade, um, then Wall Street kind of sat up and was like, oh, this can make us money, right? Big food just wants to make a profit. And if we think about food tech following their footsteps, that they want to make a profit. Um, Pat Brown of Impossible Foods said he wants to make his investors the richest, I can't remember if he said men, he probably said people, the richest people on earth, okay? He's only, he said this to me and I just couldn't believe it. Like it was such a maniacal comment because our food system doesn't keep us healthy. It's not looking out for us. No one is looking out for us. The FDA and the USDA aren't. Um, your government isn't. Your mom, now that you've moved out, is not looking out for you either. So it's your job. So anyway, so this, this, this um, the other thing that's new with the pandemic is that Wall Street, you've seen the stock market, it's crazy. It's making everybody so much money. Investors are looking for places to spend that money. Food is exciting, food is interesting. People love food. So they're investing in food tech and it's driving that, that sector. Um, I mean, the, the, well this one I complain about, it's nothing to do with future food, but do you guys know this new water by, called Liquid Death? I mean, it's ridiculous. This company just raised like $135 million. It's water in a can. So to me, this is like, this is what's wrong with food, is things like that. Like, our farmers need money, 
our agricultural system needs money, our universities need money, we need um, acad academia, like partnering up with startups to help them get to new places, and some of them are doing this, but it's, it's clouded by money. Money's not gonna make us healthy. I have to think about my health, but you guys don't. You know, you guys are all probably trying to be healthy, but you don't have to think about it every meal of the day, right? So it's, it's different. I've got one, one last poll. You guys can read it. Um, so how do we hold food companies accountable for our health? People need to learn what's healthy for their own bodies, better government regulations that reveal more about our food, not less, set frameworks on ingredients in food, like sugar labeling in Mexico and Chile, which is proven to work, ban all junk food, require food companies to set aside a portion of profits for food education. There are probably like five, 10 other ways. Now, this idea of set frameworks on ingredients in food like sugar labeling in Mexico and Chile completely works. You saw Michelle Obama get in the White House and her plan was to like change food, but she couldn't because big food is bigger than the president. And that's a problem, you know? Big food is like, don't hurt my profits. They're selling chocolate milk to schools even though chocolate milk is high in sugar and kids don't need it and schools can't get, they can't get off of it. This is like a new thing I'm like passionate about, even though I don't have kids, it makes me mad. So, oops, sorry. I think you guys all picked better government regulations that reveal more about our food, not less. But if I, I just don't know that that will happen because it hasn't happened yet. So you guys have that opportunity to help us make that happen. Um, after that, it was set frameworks on food like sugar labeling in Mexico and Chile. So I got more, but I'm going to stop there. Um, I, don't even, I don't think I have a goodbye. I think that's it. Oh, yeah, one last word cloud. After all that I talked about, and there's so much more to talk about, how do you feel? Now, this is an emotional word. Please, no, nothing dirty. How do you feel about the future of our food system? Oh. <laughs> Whoever's hungry, it's because this class is from six to eight. I think skeptical is good. I, I tried to bring that to my book, but still be optimistic. Challenging, challenging is good, intrigued, unsure, curious. Well, this is great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think it's stretch break. Thank you, Larissa. We're going to give you like seven minutes just to stretch, use the restroom. Please be back in your seat at 720. And please think of some questions for Larissa. And we will continue. We'll have about a half hour for conversation. And I want to show you a video when you come back of a trailer from a movie that was very popular when I was in high school. So stay tuned for that.
fascinating topic. If, you know, if this is a field that you're interested in and interested in potentially going into for a career or maybe doing an internship, you know, we have a, another course here at the Haas School called Plant Futures. I know some of you are in it, but it focuses specifically on this um, emergent plant-based food ecosystem. And um, I would just say that Larissa's book is a must read if you wanna get up to speed and really understand kind of the, the ecosystem and the players and who's doing what and you know just every day i can barely keep up with the news um and i think one of the real opportunities and challenges is to kind of separate the fact from the fiction and the storytelling so i wanted to just share with you a quick like two minute trailer of a movie that was very popular when i was in high school early high school, this was from 1973, and it's a movie called Soylent Green. Has anybody heard of it or seen it? A couple of you. So, anybody, you, a couple of you have seen this movie. Do you remember, did, I hadn't thought of this uh, until tonight for a long time, but did you notice at the beginning, they said the year is 2022? Isn't that crazy? So, does anybody know what Soylent Green is made from? Anybody want to take a guess? Shout it out. Yes, yeah, sp spoil it. Soylent Green is people, yeah. Um, you got it right. This, so I think, I just wanted to share this because I, I've always been really challenged with the idea of cultured food and I realized tonight, listening to Larissa, that it was because of this movie in my life. It really, it's sort of, you know, it's terrifying, this movie. If you're, I was like 14 or something when I saw it, and it really has affected me greatly. Also, because there's this whole weird conspiracy going on and lack of transparency. So I guess my revelation tonight was how influential that movie was to my worldview, to my mindset about being skeptical of processed food. And I, I was gonna tell you one other story that came up was in 20, uh, in 2009, I was at the Natural Product Show in Baltimore and a young entrepreneur uh, came up to me, he had gotten in touch with me, and at the time I was running a venture capital fund that was focused on health, sustainability, and food, personal health and planetary health. It was a bit, a, bit ahead of its time. And uh, we were one of the only venture capital firms investing in food, and that was my area of expertise. And this young man said, I, I'm working on a new uh, food that is like chicken, but it's made from soy. And I've been working with a professor in the Midwest, and we've come up with a way of making soy into a textured product that feels and has the texture of chicken meat. And um, I want to meet with you. So we met in the, in the cafe of the Marriott Hotel in Baltimore, and he <laughs> he took a sandwich that he'd made, a homemade sandwich out of his briefcase with like, you know, lettuce and it was, and, and this young man's name was Ethan Brown. I knew it, I knew and it. And the name of the company at the time was called Savage River Farms, which I thought was a terrible brand name for a food company. And he handed me this homemade sandwich, you know, took it out of the cellophane and I, bit into it and it was kind of like, you know, just, I, it didn't wow me, it, you know, it didn't, it didn't even sort of replicate. And, um, you know, I just said, I don't think this is something that is going to be oh very successful or, <laughs> you know, so. And now, and now they're at KFC and now, at And now McDonald's. they're the McPlant Burger. Um, 
Anybody interested in venture capital in this room a little bit? Well, there's this wonderful website. Uh, there's, a, there's a very famous venture capital firm called Bessemer Ventures. And they have on their website something called, I think they call it the Hall of Fame or the Hall of Shame. I can't remember. But on this website, they list all the opportunities that they missed, for, that they said no to for one reason or another. And like Apple Computer is on there. You know, we turned down Steve Jobs because we thought the price was too high. You know, that was in whatever it was, 1970 something. But anyway, that was my um, hall of shame moment yeah. where I missed. But it was, you know, it was way ahead. And, but what was new back then, the world that I grew up in with food, was that you usually got one shot at getting it right. Like you had, you know, you came out of the gate and you got one shot at impressing a customer, or an eater, or a consumer, and getting their buy-in. And you didn't get to pivot and reinvent and recreate the way... 1.0 and 2.0. Right. We only got... And there was no capital available. You had to bootstrap everything. I mean, Ethan Brown was bootstrapping, unlike yes. maybe startups of today. Ethan told me that he went to supermarkets and did tastings, and, like, you know, the women, the wives would come up to him and say, like, how do I convince my husband to eat that, right? He was, he was out at the markets taste testing, which is unusual in today's startup landscape. So he kind of has proved my old adage, which is it takes 15 years to become an overnight success in food, because he's been at it a long time, and now they're very successful. But one of the, one of the things I wanted to add to Larissa's points is that the software industry has really evolved into something that is thought of as winner take all, like companies get too big to fail. And so the amount of capital they get builds up this position where they um, are just so substantial that uh, they have to either be acquired or they get propped up in some way. Um, but what's really interesting with food that's very different from software is you're making a physical material product. And physical material products do not scale the way software does. So one of the questions I have is, how is this all going to turn out now, some of the other um, companies that are working with cells, that's different because cells can scale differently in some respects, but the final product is still material. Um, more recently, I did due diligence on another company. This might have been about five years ago. This company was started by a scientist who discovered an, a microbe at Yellowstone National Park. And I looked at it, and basically they said, we could grow this microbe into sheets of protein, and it looks kind of like jello. I mean, it's kind of white jello, and it's in these pans. And now the, and, and the firm that I was consulting with and working with did ultimately make an investment in that company, and now that companies called Nature's Find. And they, they got an astronomical raise, something like $350 million. Um, I, I'm on TikTok, and I actually have a, tic, a video trying the cream cheese and the sausage, which is all they have so far. The cream cheese is super. The sausage is hard and not super. Um, but the, yeah, the guy was working for NASA um, and discovered this microbe in a geyser at Yellowstone. Um, and Yellowstone actually has a, has a, 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 a licensing <laughs> deal on the microbe, which I think is, was actually the part of it that I was fascinated by. Um, anyways, but these companies are still aren't scaling. Like, so I, you think precision fermentation is like, just grow it like you're in a brewery and make a lot of it, but that's not what's happening. But it's the underlying assumption still is that these are global markets and that there are a lot of people in the world that don't have access to the protein sources that developed countries and America, Americans and Europeans have, and that they're going to want to be eating more of this kind of meat-like proteins. So I think that's the big bet is that there are global markets and that they have technology platforms that can be protected by intellectual property and patents and, um, and that they're gonna end up putting them in forms at prices 
that are going to be competitive. That's the long, that's the bet though, right? That's the bet, but you know, you're, you're not going to, you, are you going to put a factory in India and expect, or places where maybe the, the grid isn't so great? Or are you going to just ship frozen products to, then you're just de depending upon a, the cold chain and the same supply chain that's kind of not working great as it is now. Um, so this, no one has figured out the scaling up. Uh, Possible and Beyond slightly figured it out. They both have moments of not doing so great. They have to sign up co-manufacturers to make their goods, but they're still, it's still a frozen supply chain and they, they haven't quite unlocked um, this idea of licensing their technology and then having other people just sort of run with it is not, that, that hasn't been sorted out. So the thought experiment I wanted to invite you into is to imagine that you work for an organization, an independent organization called the Department of Unintended Consequences. And why does the world need a Department of Unintended Consequences? Well, it's because what Larissa said, the government isn't really far enough in front of technology to guide really effectively. I mean, look what we've Look what's happened in the, the last 15, 10, 15 years with social media. Look at what's emerging with privacy issues around surveillance. It's the, the, the government agencies are always lagging and then they're also highly influenced by the capital sources and source concentrations of power. So think for a minute about this technical food area that Larissa has mapped out for you. And from, if you were in the Department of Unintended Consequences, what questions would you have? What would your questionnaire say if you sent it to the um, CEO of one of these companies? Uh, what questions would you have that might get at your potential concerns about where these technologies could go if they're not guided effectively by sort of ethical concerns around, say, social justice or health or... We're, we're essentially beta testing these foods, right? Impo the Impossible Burger has heme in it, which is um, an iron, and heme is shown from red meat to, to be, be problematic in our health. So it's got a plant-based heme. What does that do? We don't know. Um, Heme is now grass generally recognized as safe, which is um, something that a company can propose to the FDA, which is basically that they prove the science and they say it's safe, but the FDA has done no work to find out if it's safe. And this is, this is happening in everywhere in our food system. Um, we're, we're eating it, but with no knowledge of, you know, what might happen in 10 years. So who's got a question for Larissa tonight? There's a mic here and there's a mic there. Please come and uh, converse with us. Introduce yourself, please. Don't be shy. Come on over, introduce yourself. Tell us what I program can, you're in. And I guess I can start us off. So I'm Viana. I am in the Metabolic Biology PhD program and becoming a registered dietitian. Hello, everybody. Hi, Viana. Um, I have one minor comment of the Soylent Green thing. There's the company called Soylent. Why would they choose that name after that movie? What a great question. That was not a question. That was not, I just like thought that I yeah. wanted to share. But my real question was we were talking about scaling up. So would there be a, a future where we don't scale up? Because I feel like that's the problem with our food system, where everything was scaled up and then monopolized. And so would it be, in your opinion, better if these maybe small food techs stayed small to allow for other um, businesses to pop up. I love that you brought that up because I have in some of the podcasts and radio uh, uh, interviews that I've done, I talk about this local treatment of new food. Um, vertical farms want to be 100,000 square foot, you know, facilities that serve, you know, food in, in Iowa, but why can't we have you know, and the Impossible Burger is everywhere and wants to be everywhere, everywhere in China. Like China already has plant-based proteins that they've been, you know, making up for decades. Um, in Nigeria, there's a stew meat. There's, there's a plant-based company that's making a stew meat that is perfect for their community and their culture. And 
if we had a plant-based cuisine that was right for regionally appropriate and we had more um, competition and more innovation, I think it's such a, a smart way to think is that we have more local solutions. And for that, because it's such a great idea, you get a book. And I'll sign it after if you want. Wow, that was a bonus. Well, that's going to get some more people coming up to the mic now. Okay, hi, my name is Hati. Um, mine is like less conceptual, more like opinionated. Um, so my focus, I'm not that tall, I don't know. Um, <laughs> my focus is more on like the youth. I, I've always focused more on like especially low income areas, like the food that is very accessible to low income areas, especially is highly processed, especially what you can get using things like EBT and WIC. It's off of a list that's extremely processed, not really healthy for you. So my question is, how, what do you recommend? Because something that really popped out to me and stood out to me is that you said you look through food. So when you look at something, you don't see, oh, this is tasty. How is this healthy for me? Because you of your underlying health conditions. For someone like me that's 19, no like health conditions. I grew up in a low income area eating hot Cheetos and just really bad food for me when I was like so young. Now that I'm 19, I still have time to be able to change the way that I look at food and, and be able to do that for the rest of my life, hopefully, obviously. Um, what is your, I guess, not opinion, but also your advice on how can we look at food differently? Because it's really hard from right now me eating meat and craving chips and craving probably completely wax and processed chocolates and things like that. Like, how can I tomorrow be able to start looking at food differently if it's not something that I, it is like vital for me to do? And I think it's important to understand that because if we do that for ourselves, then we can do that for if we decide to have kids or our family, things like that. So what do you recommend for us to start viewing food differently on small scales to be able to make such a big change? So great, um, and I love that you asked that because you know it's like I'm not a nutritionist and I wasn't a trained you know like health professional, but like obviously you see that I've got this passion for you know figuring out how to eat right, and and everyone asks me actually, all my friends and family and you know strangers ask me like how to eat better, um, you know, Michael Pollan says you know eat mostly plants, not too much, right? That is that is the line. It is to eat little that comes in a package, right? I, I do like crackers, but I will make my own crackers also out of seeds. Um, it, anything processed and packaged and cheap, this class is, is one way to, to shape your mind differently. And other nutrition classes or books is one way to shape your mind differently. Um, but it's eating whole foods as much as you can. I also say eat as much variety so when you see yourself buying something every day, or when you see your, the, the brain chemistry wanting to tell you to buy those chips, take a moment to go outside of yourself and to see that, that reaction when you want those chips or why you want those chips. Because you want as much variety, because that's what's gonna feed your microbiome. And the fiber in foods is what's gonna feed your microbiome. But like the pea protein in a, in a Beyond Burger isn't going to feed your microbiome with fiber like a, a real pea will. And, th and that's like my principle. How can I get as much variety, even though sometimes I'm going to have the donut or the Impossible Burger or whatever, the KFC nugget, like sometimes I have junk food. But like how can I make sure, like every time I go to the market, I try to put something new in my cart. One week it's a red pepper, another week it's bamboo shoots or cabbage or scallions, just... <clears throat> When's the last time you had one of those? Two days ago. <laughs> so an orange, which grows locally, pretty affordable, filled with vitamins, and three grams of fiber in every orange. Do you realize that? That's and juice doesn't have fiber. And orange juice, they take the flavor out, so they can they can they can make it. They can homogenize. They can make it one and they thing, often add and then sugar. they add orange coloring back in. Don't drink juice. Don't drink juice. But eat an orange. It's very confusing. <laughs> eat the orange, don't drink the juice. 
That That's it, a wonderful question. Education. Uh, I talk about that like kids need education. Young kids need education, and that's where we make change. And one of the one of the um, the one of the resources that I want to make sure you all become familiar with is a newsletter called Food Politics, that's published daily by Marion Nessel, who is one of the <clears throat> foremost experts really on on food food politics, and she wrote today about the WHO has just re-released their newest report on, they've updated their report on food marketing and how pervasive it is to, to children, how effective it is, and um, how much uh, money is spent on it. And so, you know, as you think about becoming a change maker first in your own life, and then finding these leverage points, um, that's where you're gonna get the most satisfaction, I think, from you know, following your, your instincts about how to make things better. In, in Mexico, they, they confiscated cereal boxes because Kellogg's had put Tony the Tiger on it, okay? Now they have rules against marketing to kids like this. We, I don't know, we have them, we don't have them, they don't work. We have got tigers on everything. We've got like, you know, mascots selling us junk food, right? But in Mexico, they confiscated them because they couldn't have it on there. I mean, that's amazing. You know, we, I mean, I, I grew up in Los Angeles, so I lived really close to Mexico. And so I feel like Mexico to me is an extension of California. But like, people look at Cal Mexico like they're just, I don't know, like it's like a, you know, third, third world, right? But they're like actually looking for, out for people's health and children's health. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Yeah. Who else you wants to talk orange. to you? You could get an orange, you could get a book, you could get two oranges. Come, come on down, sure. All right. <laughs> Hi, Larissa, thanks for coming to campus tonight. Uh, my name's Andrew, I'm in the full-time MBA program. Uh, Really changing gears from that last question, that was an awesome question. Uh, it's a bit more of a follow-up on Viana's and to some of the conversation you were having with Will earlier. Do you think that this influx in VC in the food space is kind of here to stay, or do you think it'll kind of come out in the wash eventually um, because of what you were saying about how it is hard to scale and like you're not really, like it's really hard to become rich overnight in the food space. So like. Will it eventually just sort of run up against its own limitations, or do you think it's going to be something that's pervasive for a long time? Um, I think that what I'm waiting to happen is um, some kind of reset where there's some big failures. And that may take time. So I think investment's going to stay until some failures happen on a big scale. Um, <clears throat> it could be in vertical farms, which are really just plowing through money. Um, I usually use them as sort of my poster child for like, how can this be happening? Because they're just spending so much money to like figure out how to do robots and sensors and you know, grow food in buildings. Um, I also think that the other thing that could happen is like some serious drought or like, like hunger issues that could, uh, another pandemic that could really escalate things far that could also force us into these worlds of food tech. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm thinking it's like gonna be something big and dramatic that makes it that change. There, um, there are historically lots of cycles in VC. So if you go back to 2007 and 2008, there was a lot of money poured into clean tech, it was called, and most of it didn't deliver. Um, there, were, there were some very notable you know, disasters. Um, Solyndra was one that got national attention. So I think Larissa's right, it's gonna take a little bit of time, but the amount of capital that's being invested is unprecedented. And I mean, if you, it's just interesting to me too to, to look at um, when these companies get all of this venture capital, like hundreds of millions, and then all of a sudden you see a stadium named after that company, you know? Um, and then it's really interesting when they go public and you look at their S1 filing, you find out that they don't, they're not making money. Yeah. And so another, another um, 
analog that we've talked about in the business school a lot is Blue Apron. Because Blue Apron, at one moment, this was a venture-backed company by Bessemer, the one I mentioned to you. Um, and they ran up to a billion dollar valuation based on people buying those meal kits. And then, w after, then they went public. And then just a few months, years later, it was like worth under 100 million and then under 20 million. And um, it was basically that the venture capital pushed the revenues up, the market got very excited, the investors got out, and then you know, it sort of reconciled itself. Yeah. Uh, one trend that's been happening, um, especially in vertical farms, is a SPAC deal, which is that they basically go public to get more money mm -hmm. um, by, by going with a shell company to, to, that, that is public. And what that's doing is it's bringing in investment money from regular people. Um, and the stocks are not doing well, but more companies are doing, taking advantage of this like SPAC deal moment in time. And I think that could, that could blow up in a, it, sooner than the than Special the Purpose the Acquisition Corporation, SPAC. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Thank you. Yeah. Somebody up here. Um, hi. Oh, this is too low. Okay. Um, Hi, so first of all, thank you for being here. Um, I'm from Mexico, so I got to see many marketing teams losing it because of the whole tigers thing and animals. So that was funny, that's the first part. Um, then secondly, um, Mexico being a country that has almost half of its population under the poverty line, um, many people are not able to afford to buy food that's actually nutritious. Sometimes the option is even like buying a soda so a child can literally like feel full for 12 hours. And that, like, it's logical that over 75% of Mexicans over the age of 20 are either overweight or obese. So um, have you seen any technologies that have been applied to target these kind of problems? Yeah, I mean, so let me just ask, tell, to repeat the question, which is that um, in Mexico, people are forced to, to buy things like cheap soda to help keep their kids full um, or to feed their kids just cheap nutrients because that's all they have available. And is there any technology to you know, counteract that? I mean, there's not technology. There's governments stepping in that don't allow for these cheap foods to be sold. Uh, um, I mean, I, I don't want a future of, that depends upon our food being cheap. I want a system that allows where you are in the, in, the, in the socioeconomic scale of things to be able to afford good, nutritious food. That takes education early. It takes um, these companies that just want profit to be directed to do things differently. It needs like scales of pricing so that we don't have to expect cheap food because our food shouldn't be cheap. I mean, farmers work hard. Um, you know, it, 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 it should be expensive. The cacao farmers make a couple hundred dollars a year. Chocolate should be more expensive, but then it should, it should be like tiers of pricing or something, some fashion of like the big food has to like come up with different ways of addressing if, there, if Mexico has you know, if 75% are obese or have um, diabetes, then, then it needs to be directly correlated back to the companies that are selling the foods. Um, so it's actually, to me, it's not technology. It's, it's, it's it, yeah, it's, it's, it's government policy. policy. It's, it's, you know, people like you lobbying for like change. It's, you know, getting more thought leaders to like speak out about these things. I mean, impressively, you know, Mexico and Chile, I think India is doing it too soon too, which is like labeling on packages that are high in sugar, right? Which stops people from buying them. So it's, it's things like that that actually do make change. It's not technology, it's just, you know, actually like putting an end to the American diet, which we are shipping out and making people unhealthy. It's a good transition because the reading this week is about the true cost of food. So there's a lot of work being done right now to really understand what the true cost of food is and where the subsidies and marketing and all 
um, change both perceptions and access. So we're gonna wrap up on that. Thanks very much for your question. You. Really appreciate it, your comments. Thanks for being here tonight. One, one more question. We, we have to oh, do one, our, okay, one go one ahead. question and you get the book, so make okay. it real good. Yeah, oh, come on, green shirt. Super quick question. Um, so at the plant-based symposium this year, there was a stat um, told by uh, Seth Goldman, and he said that there's like 500,000 species of plants and 57% um, of like industrial agriculture just uses like five of them. When you were talking about a lot of the startups and tech right now, I just kind of saw history repeating itself. It's like, oh, we're just gonna use grape seeds. Oh, we're just gonna use mung bean, pea protein, da 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 da. And I'm like, ooh, this is kind of a problem. So one, um, do you see like a business model that like incentivizes biodiversity and kind of you know tips the scale so we don't have 57% just with five? Mm -hmm. And two, at the current moment, do you see like all tech in food spaces kind of going towards a history of being itself situation? Um, great question. So worthy of the book. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to be <laughs> real quick. Um, thank you, and I'll sign it. Um, so I, I think grape seeds actually is kind of a strange thing that we haven't eaten yet. Okay, so I do think grape seeds is, a, is an outlier, but um, how can we incentivize it? I think that's a great idea. Um, I think Dan Barber would have a good, 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 good thought there, but the reason they, they, they might start with something different, like, um, I don't know, not chickpeas, but they might start with like kidney beans, right? And then they're like, oh wait, but soy is grown everywhere and it's cheap and peas are grow growing in more places and they're, they're gonna be cheap too. So it's like, we do have to start with the farmers. We do have to start with farmers growing things differently and knowing that they have a market to sell them to. Um, so it's, it's, it's changing subsidies so that farmers are incentivized to grow different foods. I also like what's in your question is like, what are the values? If you value biodiversity, yeah. which is core to Dan Barber's new company, Row 7, mm -hmm. you know, he's trying to breed seeds that produce more delicious vegetables. Mm -hmm. He has a different theory of change. So um, going back and looking at what the kind of founding principles and values of the companies and the founders are to see what they value is I think really important kind of due diligence in this whole question. So um, Jackie, can I, where's Jackie? Can you, um, maybe Pooja, can you do the last slide with next week's homework? And Jackie, can you share what that is with the class? So I'll let Jackie. Um, yeah, so so basically the details is on B courses and um, your homework would be uh, to source your favorite meal, which is, uh, and the carbon impact of that. Yeah, there's a carbon impact calculator link that's provided. So you can use that if there's something else, another resource that you wanna use, go ahead, just uh, share a link to that in your write-up as well. Yes, yeah, and then the discussions that we have, so we have a, a reflection on this week like we normally do, and then we have a like creative visioning exercise uh, that we're calling the postcard from the future, where we're asking you to take everything that we have talked about today and over the past couple of weeks and think about if you had to pick, it could be very specific, um, but one, one part of the future, how, how do you see it? How do you describe it? You're writing a postcard to a friend, um, and you, it, can, it can describe whatever, whatever aspect of the future in whatever direction that you want. So kind of pick one of the threads that we've talked about um, and pull at it and see where you go with that. Also, guys, I have a newsletter that I send out every Friday. You can sign up for it on my website. My website's just my full name. Um, my book's available everywhere, but go to your local bookstore. Um, if you wanna connect to me on LinkedIn, I'm happy to connect to you. And remember, Soylent Green came out in 1972 with the year 2022 <laughs> as the future. Thanks for being here tonight. Bye Thank bye. you. Oh, and please help yourself to an orange, three grams of fiber. <laughs>